Hi everyone, my name's Cynthia Deeran and welcome to the Business Beyond Borders podcast where we unlock the secrets of international business success. My guest today is Luca Pastiglione, the founder of Luca, Luca Marketing, a company which specializes in digital and traditional marketing services for small and medium-sized companies. Now, Luca is originally from Italy and he's worked in Europe, in the United States and in Australia. He's also run companies of his own in Italy and in Australia. Today, Luca works with companies from across the spectrum to revolutionize their marketing strategy from multinational corporations right through to startups. But his real passion is the luxury sector. And today we're going to spend some time talking about how you go about making a luxury business into an international success. Luca, welcome to the show. Thank you, Cynthia. It's a pleasure to be here. You're originally from Italy, from a very uh, eclectic and a very talented family. <laughs> I'm, I'm curious to know how you got interested in international business. Was it something that you just grown up with? Was it something you always wanted to do? Or was it something that just kind of happened to you along the way? Well, um, thank you, Cynthia. That's a very interesting uh, question because a lot of people um, I find uh, know what their vocation is at a very young age. And that wasn't the case with me. Um, I grew up in Italy. I grew up in Florence. Uh, my father was a diplomat. So I grew up in that sort of environment with politics, uh, being surrounded by politics at all times. And international business came into my life very late in my life. So um, it's interesting because I went to an international school and I was surrounded by people from all sorts of different cultures. So I was exposed to different languages, different ways of life, different, um, uh, different experiences and different ways of doing things as well. And immediately that gave me an interest in exploring the world and exploring what's out there. Um, the, so the international business aspect of it, though, came on later on because I've always wanted to be involved in sort of international politics or politics because of what my dad was doing. Um, and yeah, so essentially I went to university and I studied international relations and politics and I found that that actually wasn't what I wanted to do. <laughs> and I, I found that um, business was more of interest to me because it was more factual. It was more, uh, it was something more tangible than just words. And so uh, after my undergraduate degree, I decided that I wanted to take a year off and travel. Um, and I spent a little bit of time in, in LA where I had a friend of mine living there and um, one day my mother calls me up and says, my, one of my dear friends um, has a contact in LA who works for the Italian American Chamber of Commerce. And I said, well, that's interesting. Let me have a chat with them. So I went and met this person uh, in their offices and they offered me a job. They offered me an, intern <laughs> an internship. Um, and I was thrilled. I was like, oh, that's interesting. Uh, why don't I do this while I check out, you know, LA and California? Because I, I already had a lot of friends there going to an American school. And so, um, and so I worked for this person for six months and I found it fascinating. And that's how I got into business. And so do you count that experience with the Chamber of Commerce as your first foray into international business? Yeah, I would say that that was my first experience. Um, we were, so the Chamber of Commerce was mainly interested in Italian companies moving to the West Coast of the US and setting up um, a subsidiary there and operating in the US. So um, immediately I was exposed to that cultural difference between Italian businesses uh, and American businesses and how businessmen would interact. And I found that absolutely fascinating. Um, uh, what, what was what was the big difference there for you? I mean, what did you uh, what did you find the big differences were when you went off to the US? Uh, well, just differences, cultural differences in doing business that are very uh, prominent. Like, for instance, Italians. I mean, these are gross generalizations, but you would be able to see these in meetings as well. Italians tend to use a lot of big words, and they tend to beat around the bush a lot, whereas Americans are very to the point, you know, uh -huh. and, and you could definitely tell that, you know, at times, I mean, me being exposed to both cultures, I could see what someone was trying to say, 
but not say, and then the other person understanding something completely different. Like for instance, the word um, eventually, right? The word, so in Italian, eventualmente means um, maybe. It means it could happen, but eventually in English means it will happen in the future. Yeah. So there's a big, big difference there. Someone might be saying, you know, you know, eventualmente I could invest $10,000 in that. And the, and the American person thinks, oh, so down the line, they will be investing $10,000 in that product or something. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I found that really interesting. But you don't have to go as far as US, Italy. You can already see it between US and England, which you'd think, oh, you know, there are cultural differences, but, you know, they're not as apparent as they are between Italy and the US. But if you think of, for instance, the word to table something, mm. right? Now, in the U.S., to table means to put it aside, not talk about it. Whereas in the U.K., to table means to actually discuss it. Yeah, absolutely. So, so there's a big difference there. So, yeah, so the, the, the experience with the Italian Chamber of Commerce was, uh, was eye-opening. And I, and I found that um, my background, my upbringing really helped me uh, uh, within that environment. I, I saw that that could have been, you know, a path for me to take. Yeah. And so how did you go from working with the American Italian Chamber of Commerce in the United States to yeah. starting a business focused on luxury a few years ago? <laughs> so tell us a little bit about how you got there and also yeah. tell, tell us w what was it about luxury that resonated with you that drew you in that direction? Yeah. Well, um, I obviously, I, I did a number of different jobs before I set up my luxury business. And I also did my master's in business administration in, in the UK. So I worked in uh, automotive before I set up my own business. Um, I worked in the marketing department of a French company of Renault. Um, and from there, then I realized that uh, within the marketing department, uh, there was a lot to learn. And doing my MBA, I, you know, I really found that uh, it, it resonated with me. I, I really enjoyed doing it and I wanted to go off on my own. Now, so it's interesting because with Renault being such a massive business um, and having such a structured way of carrying out marketing activities, you learn a lot about the execution of things, right? So you're within a big department, someone comes to you and says, this is how it works. But then when you actually study marketing in detail, you notice that you know, marketing can be uh, applied at different levels and within different sectors and so on and so forth. And I found that you know, I could apply it to something that I really enjoyed, which was, uh, to, to start off with, was fashion luxury. Yeah. Um, because initially I had thought of that I could go into the fashion industry with a luxury product and sell it around the world using my marketing and business background, my marketing and business knowledge. Um, and th the reason I went, I was thinking of going into fashion is because, you know, growing up in, in Italy, fashion is very apparent. Wherever you go, everyone's very well dressed. And, um, and especially in Florence, you have a tendency to really enjoy um, handmade, handcrafted, garments right yeah. so rather than going to a store and grabbing a shirt off a, off a rack you would go um, either to a tailor or you would go to a manufacturer that has tailors in it to select the uh, to select the different garments and make whatever sorry textiles and and, and make whatever garments you need so uh, and I grew up with that so, so that was an integral part of who I was and so I thought, well, you know, in Italy, it's so prominent. Why not take that overseas? Yeah. Um, and so I investigated that. I did a lot of research into that. And while I was doing my research, I uh, sort of came across a number of artisans that were working precious metals. So they were working silver. They were working gold and platinum. Uh, but they were also working semi-precious semi stones. So they were making what's called intarsiato, which is a type of technique to make tables out of semi-precious stones. Um, and I was, you know, very curious and, and I found that incredibly interesting. And so I kept on asking them questions. So, you know, who are your clients? Where do you sell? Do you sell abroad? 
And a vast majority of these artisans would only sell locally. Yeah. So they would only sell to local retailers or occasionally they would have people go to their um, manufacturers and buy directly from them. And so my first approach was, you know, would you be interested in taking your products abroad? And, you know, again, the vast majority of them said yes, because financially they weren't, you know, doing incredibly well. They were surviving. They're doing well. They had their little manufacturers. They were selling locally, but it's not like they were um, minted, if you will. So so my idea there was this is, so we're talking just to give you a little bit of a timeline. So we were talking probably 2003, 2003, Mm -hmm. 2004. so there, the idea was to create my own line of luxury products and sell those products to high net worth individuals. Why did, why did I want to go to that specific niche? Because um, it's very hard to be able to invest in high volume when you're starting off from scratch, right? Especially when it comes to um, artisans and people who work with handmade products. So yes. it's not like you reach the masses with, um, you know, home accessories made out of silver. You would have to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars, which at that time I thought was an incredible risk. So I said, well, let me try and see how things progress. And I will um, use my contacts around the world. Um, but first off, I'll create a luxury collection. And then through that, so with that, I will go to my contacts around the world and see how it's perceived by them. And so I did a little bit of market research. So I went to the US, I went to the UK. So I traveled around to various countries, um, talking to my contacts and and gathering as much feedback as I could from them. Um, And the feedback was very positive. So I thought, well, it's probably the right time to start investing in this. And and so it, it sort of happened consequentially. Yeah. And so what happened next once you've done that market research? So once I did that market research, then I realized that um, around the world, there is a, a group of people. It's, a, it's, it's, tra- it's transnational. There's a, mm. there's a socioeconomic band of people um, that aren't necessarily tied to countries who can afford these types of products. Now, remember, this isn't the mass market. This isn't Gucci. This isn't, you know, Prada. This is, these are products that are handmade, custom made out of precious metal for someone who requests something in particular. So they're, they're incredibly expensive products and they're one-offs. So it's more like a piece of art rather than some commodity made in a factory in China. That's, That's exactly right. Almost like a piece of art. Um, so some of it was jewelry, some of it were home accessories. Um, you know, some, some of them were, just to give you an example, uh, one of the products that I had was, was a seashell, like a huge, huge shell, um, like a conch shell, if you will, made out of silver, all handmade out of silver. Right. I mean, it's a massive, massive piece, and it's absolutely yeah. gorgeous. Uh, but it takes hours and hours, and it needs to be done in a specific way. And, and these are artisans who have learned their skill from their father who in turn learn their skill from their father. So it's been going on for generations and generations. And the, the sad thing in Italy nowadays is that these artisans are dying out because, you know, their offspring, their children don't want to do that. They don't want to be part of the family business. They want to go and be lawyers or doctors because of the massive recession that there is and or not recession, but uh, economic difficulties that there are in, in Southern Europe. So where, uh, because you don't run this company anymore, but, but no. by the time you exited that company, how, yeah. where had you got to, who, who were you selling to, uh, you know, were uh, you selling mainly to Europe or to other parts of the world? What was that picture I like? Was, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was selling around the world. So, so when I started, it was mainly selling through to high net worth individuals. That was my first step to see if I could actually do that. Um, and you know, along the way I made a lot of mistakes along the way. I, again, I was on my own. So, um, the learning curve was pretty steep. 
Uh, mm. and, I learned, and I learned making mistakes, which isn't ideal, but um, it's the way it went. And, um, and then slowly, slowly, I realized that um, in order to make, to, make the sim to make the business simpler, I had to reach out to retailers as well who had their um, customer base of high net worth individuals. Yes. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to name anyone, but you know, big jewelries in, in the UK, big jewelries in the United States and, uh, and other countries as well. Um, and so that's how the business grew. Yeah. Um, so what I did is I created a collection that could be replicated in terms of numbers. So instead of having one shell, you could have a hundred shells, yes. right? Just to give you the shell example. Um, and that way I could go to these jewelries or companies that had more than one jewelry. Uh, for instance, Ireland was a, a country that I invested in heavily and researched greatly to start off with because of the similarities with Italy in terms of the religion, in terms of, the, um, you know, uh, of the population and, and so on and so forth. So that was one of the countries that I invested heavily in. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to go to not only the individual jeweler, but I wanted to go to companies that, or, you know, someone who owned three or four jewelry. So I could go and with one hit sell maybe tens or hundreds of products, which would make it worthwhile for me. Yeah. So, so I've got a couple of But I still maintain yeah. contacts. I still maintain the contacts with high net worth individuals. So those were direct sales that I would do through them. So I had a couple of questions just to finish up on this uh, topic of luxury before we move on. When yeah. you think about the concept of luxury, do you think that it, uh, in your experience, did it vary much from one country to the next? And if it did, what, what do those differences look like? Yeah. Well, well luxury can be defined in, in many ways. I mean, people can think, I mean, it depends on how you uh, perceive things. Like, for instance, Lexus could be considered luxury. So that's one type of luxury or um, a handmade um, wallet made out of a special type of leather um, that costs $6,000 is luxury. Um, yes. An incredible experience. Like for instance, uh, visiting a, the Uffizi gallery or the, yeah, the Uffizi gallery on a Monday when it's closed with a professor from Harvard, that's luxury. So yeah. it, Absolutely. Certain things more than anything else. Like so, what I noticed with what I noticed with sorry with the high net worth individuals was that they always wanted something that no one else could have, so that they, they could brag about it. So not I like that, that definition. So luxury is having things that other people can't have. That's right. So, but not yeah, and it's not only a product; it can be a service as well. As I gave you the example of you know, um, of the Uffizi Gallery or uh, the, the Vasari Corridor, which is the corridor that goes from the Uffizi to, um, to Palazzo Pitti. And it, it goes on top of the Ponte Vecchio. And it's, uh, it's the gallery. It's the gallery that has all the most famous self-portraits in the world. So, um, you know, being able to go through it with a Harvard professor explaining or an Oxford professor explaining exactly you know, the history of it, that's, it's mind blowing. It's, it's luxury. Yeah. You know? I think that's a fantastic example. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. what, um, what, if we just thinking about what is key to making a luxury business internationally successful, what do yeah. you think there, is there some, um, X factor that's special to the luxury sector that makes it different from other sectors in terms of what you need to do to make it a success on an international scale? Look, in my experience, so I start, I tried to start off small because I wanted to test the market. And one of the main things that proved to be absolutely uh, pivotal was researching the market first. So uh, seeing, you know, how big was the, the segment of high net worth individuals within a specific country? How would they operate? Where would they work? Where would they spend their money? You know, how to reach out to them? And then, so the one thing is research. And secondly, um, and that's an incredibly important point as well, is contacts. Um, so networking. So contacts doesn't necessarily mean that you know someone and you go direct to them. It might mean that, you know, you have to network through who you know 
to get to meet other people and interact with them and then see if they're interested in your product or service. So contacts, again, is, is an, and you can create them. I mean, you don't necessarily have to have them. I was very um, privileged growing up that I had a lot of contacts and that's what led me into this. Um, but it was also the fact that, you know, I spent a lot of time researching specific markets to see what they liked as well. Mm. Now, Luca, you were working in the luxury sector and running a business in the luxury sector when the global financial crisis yeah. hit. What, what was that like as an experience to, to be working in a, a sector which is heavily dependent on people spending a lot of money and then to be uh, in an environment where suddenly in Europe money was in extremely short supply? Yeah. So remember that I started in about 2003. And by the time the global financial crisis hit in 2007, I had built a pretty stable business. Okay. And not only, but I was at a stage where I could risk a little bit more because I had a little bit more capital to invest and I had a lot of contacts. And that was a, the stage in which I was going from uh, direct sales to high net worth individuals to selling to retailers. So not only just individual retailers, but chain, a chain of retailers. Okay. I'm not, again, I, I prefer not to name names, but um, I had two big contracts ready to go. And I had invested in stock. I had invested in contracts. I had invested uh, in making sure that everything could be done swiftly as you know, it had been done in the past. So, so I went to a meeting with um, the owner of this chain of retailers and we sat down and I had, I, I'll never forget this. I had the contract in front of me, ready to go. And he was ready to sign and, you know, his, his um, entourage was there as well, presented everything, everyone's uh, happy to go. And then the owner sat back and said, listen, um, you know, I received news that there might be a little financial hiccup, which might take three or four months to resolve. Um, let's uh, postpone this for just, just six months, right? And then we can get back on top of it. Oh my <laughs> well, as, gosh. <laughs> as you can imagine, I never heard from him again. <laughs> um, so that happened in two countries. One was, one was a very significant, one very substantial amount of money uh, that didn't eventuate. And, um, and the other one was slightly smaller, but still, you know, a significant amount. Um, so that, that essentially um, made me rethink everything because, the global, the, again, the global financial crisis was unexpected. Um, there, are, there are financial crises that are cyclical. They, you know, uh, every X amount of years, you can expect things to go down and then they go back up and then they go back down. It, it, it's economics. It happens uh, regularly. But the actual global financial crisis, uh, to that extent and cal to that sort of extent yeah magnitude was unexpected um and that had a massive effect on my business so with that in mind i mean is there anything that looking back that you wish you'd known when you started or anything that you think wow yeah. you know with hindsight i wish i'd done that differently yeah well again as i said earlier i made a lot of mistakes because i was on my own and i was um you know, I, the, the good old trial and error, you're, you're a small business, you think you can do it on your own. If I had had a little bit more advice, if I had had a little bit more um, counseling, maybe from a business perspective, um, maybe, you know, things would have been different. I, I also was at a stage, as I said earlier, where I was uh, quite risk prone because I had built a business and had capital to invest. And, and maybe, you know, if someone had said, okay, make sure that you have X amount just in case something happens. So mitigating your risk yeah. um, and, and expect the unexpected. <laughs> I, think that, I think that is a great piece of advice. Yeah. So if we fast forward to the present, these days yeah. you're based in Sydney, Australia, and yeah. your key focus is marketing, but you still work mm. with clients from around the world. How do mm. you make that happen? Yeah, so um, I have a lot of contacts internationally. Um, I've worked in marketing for many years, and occasionally things might come up uh, overseas. Um, 
how, how do you make that happen? You travel a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you know, you have these contacts and, and you make the most of it. Um, uh, they respect you as, as, as someone who's worked in the marketing industry for very long and who is continuously learning, which is part of marketing as well. Not only, you know, sitting back and saying, I've done this in the past. Things uh, develop on a daily basis and evolve. So you really have to be on top of things. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's a question of being constantly in touch with people, networking. LinkedIn is always a very helpful and useful uh, tool to use, but also um, video calls through Skype. Uh, nowadays, it's a lot easier than you know, 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago. Now it's a lot easier to be in touch with people with WhatsApp or Skype and so on and so forth. And uh, work can, all, can also be done remotely without, not, you know, without a lot of hiccups um, and headaches. So occasionally, yep, I do fly over and meet with people, uh, but I'm, I'm based in Sydney, yeah. And that's really exciting, isn't it? That you can work internationally even though you are located in somewhere that's at a far end of the world. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, before I set up my own consulting business, um, I was head of marketing of a jewelry company and I was traveling probably three weeks out of the month I was away. Um, yes. And that's because of how big the business was and it required certain attention around the world, but also trade shows and meeting with clients. Um, but that's not me. <laughs> I, if you want to have a family, I have two little children. I want to spend time with them and, you know, traveling around the world is great, but, um, family comes first. <laughs> I think that's really interesting though, because I know a lot of people who are listening will be wondering, well, you know, I have a family, maybe I have young children or I have a spouse who doesn't want me to be away all the time. Can I still have a business that has an international focus? And I think, uh, mm -hmm. Lupo marketing is a really good illustration of the fact that yeah. you actually can have your cake and eat it too. But also, Cynthia, it depends on how you define, you know, international business. You might have um, a small or medium sized business and you sell, say, for instance, you sell products online. If you are selling overseas, you have an international business. Absolutely. Now, the way you set it up can be to expand that arm of your business or not. But if you wish to expand it, then you have to invest more resources, time and money in that um, to then, you know, sell globally as well. But you don't necessarily have to, you know, travel overseas constantly if you have a small business and want to sell in different countries. So, you know, it depends on the business, depends on how big it is, depends on the sector you're in. Um, you know, some tech businesses can be located somewhere but operate worldwide really depends on, uh, depends on what type of business you're in. Yeah, I think that's a great point. So at this point, you are, in a sense, working internationally because you are Italian, but you're now in Australia. So there's a real international component there. And you're also working internationally in the other sense that you're based here, yet you're working with clients from places like Switzerland and the States. Yeah. Is there something about those two things or that combination of stuff that really gets you excited? Yeah, well, I love travel. I've always traveled. I love um, exploring. I'm very curious. Uh, uh, I really enjoy um, learning from new cultures from a personal perspective. I'm a foodie as well, so I enjoy you know trying new foods. And um, but from a business perspective, uh, I find it fascinating how you know you talk to a lot of people and they say again gross generalizations, but you, what you hear a lot is, you know, this market is saturated or uh, there's not much else that we can do in that market. It's too small or everything's been done. You know, you hear that a lot, but I disagree. I think there's a lot of new opportunities out there in a lot of different sectors and industries. And, and Australia is the prime example. Um, there are a lot of products that are now um, coming into the Australian markets that are being sold even just to give you an example, Italian products, linen, coffee, uh, all sorts of different products that are entering the Australian market um, that, ha that you know, were not here five years ago. So some people might think, oh, but Sydney is saturated or uh, Melbourne saturated. It's not. And that's, that, these are goods that are being sold. When it comes to the tech industry, I mean, I don't even have to get into that because, you know, you can think 
all sorts of things from cryptocurrencies to um, apps to, you know, the, the opportunities, blockchain for one. I mean, the opportunities are absolutely endless. Um, so yeah, I think there's, there's, I love traveling around because I, I love exploring um, the products that are in specific countries, but also how people um, perceive certain products or go about doing things that is different from the way that I'm used to doing things. You know what I mean? Yeah, um, absolutely. Yeah. So, so both I want just to circle back for a minute to uh, the topic that we touched on close to the start of our chat, which is about cultural sensitivity. And I wanted to ask you, you know, you were telling us about some of your experiences with seeing cultural difference between Italy and the States. Yeah. How important do you think cultural sensitivity is when you're doing business internationally? And did you find the cultural transition from Italy to Australia to be a big one? So to answer your first question, I think um, being culturally sensitive is absolutely uh, fundamental. Um, one of the first things when you sit down with a potential client is gaining their trust, gaining their trust and gaining their respect. Now, trust might take months or years, right? But it's built um, on, on little steps is what I say. So, so even just uh, acknowledging that you're being respectful towards their culture, uh, mm -hmm. knowing a phrase or a, or a word in their culture already um, breaks the ice, if you will. So that's something, you know, that probably comes from my dad and the diplomatic background, but being able to reach out, um, and be friendly and understand their culture, showing respect is, is the first thing. So, so if you go into a meeting and you know absolutely nothing about the other person, including their culture and background, then you could fall into traps or faux pas that could result in the, the meeting not going as intended. Um, so I think it's absolutely imperative to be respectful from a cultural perspective, but how do you do that? You research their culture. So you learn more about, so again, the importance of research in everything, especially in terms of cultural sensitivity. And if you think about international marketing and, and the, the range of experiences you've had in international yeah. marketing, what's the biggest mistake you've seen somebody make <laughs> when they've been yeah. you know, marketing something to another? to another country or to another culture. Yeah, uh, well, you see this every day. You see this every day, especially, you know, in retail in Australia, you'll have big brands. Again, I'm not gonna name any brands, but you have big brands come in to Australia. And they, for instance, in the fashion retail, come in, they spend three, four months, they set up all these stores, and then they close shop and go back. You know, big American brands, and you're thinking, wow, what happened there? And most likely, they didn't do their research. They thought, oh, Australia is very similar to the US. It's just a smaller market. We'll go in, we'll open shop, we'll do, we'll do well, you know? And, but, but they don't, and they lose a lot of money. And those are big mistakes. Now, from, from a cultural perspective, there are tens of really even amusing faux pas that have been made. You know, one of them, I have to name it, otherwise it doesn't make any sense, but, the, you know, Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi, yeah. the car brand. Now, um, the, the Pajero, you know, the Mitsubishi Pajero. Well, mm -hmm. Pajero is actually a bad word in Spanish. <laughs> I think I remember reading somewhere that it meant wanker. Would that be right? That's exactly right. That's exactly right. So, so that happened and immediately they had to pull the cars and change, change their names from Pajero to Montero. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, the other funny one um, is with Electrolux, which is a Swedish brand, as you know. And when they entered the American market, um, they they came up with a slogan, which was "Nothing sucks like an Electrolux." <laughs> so that didn't go very well. And <laughs> uh, they were wondering why sales were down. <laughs> <laughs> oh, those are a couple of great examples. Luca, sure. we are very quickly running out of time, but I was wondering uh, whether you had any wise words of advice for uh, people listening to the podcast who are 
just at the beginning of that journey and thinking about expanding their business internationally, what, yeah. what would you say to them? I would say, first off, research as much as possible. Um, ask for help. Um, have advisors help you, consultants, because that way you reduce, you reduce your risk factor and also um, reduce your, uh, the amount of mistakes you're going to make across, uh, along the way. Uh, the reason that's important is because you accelerate your, um, your, the, so you basically make it easier for you to go to market, but also you spend less money on making mistakes like I did throughout my experience. Now, the other really important point is network as much as you can. Network through LinkedIn, network through social gatherings, network, 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 to not only uh, meet new people, but also to get people's feedback on an idea, product, or service you may have. Um, and lastly, and in, in conjunction with that, a lot of, uh, I hear often, you know, that people might have ideas and they don't want to share them. And I think, I think if you have an idea and you think it's a great idea, I think you should share it as much as possible um, to get as much feedback as you can. And if people copy you and it's a great idea, it's the product or service you're offering is, uh, is, is always going to be better than theirs. So, so those three things are, I think, um, advice that I would give to someone. That's great advice. I especially love that last point. Luca, it has been fantastic having you come on the show. I've really enjoyed chatting to you and hearing your insights on how to make your business an international success. And I look forward to having you back here again in the future. Thank you, Cynthia. It's been my pleasure.